Welcome to the exciting world of capital budgeting. In this chapter, we're going to learn how to make long-term business decisions for a company. Because these decisions are long-term, the cash flows related to the decisions span over multiple years, and we'll have to consider the concept of time value of money that you've learned in Intro to Financial Accounting. Time value of money basically is a concept that means money today is worth more than money tomorrow. I highly recommend that you use your HP 10B in this chapter. It's going to make life a heck of a lot easier. Otherwise, you're going to have to teach yourself how to use the charts because I do not go through them because we require the financial calculator for the class. So first of all, capital budgeting decisions include, again, long-term decisions like plant expansion, choosing between different equipment options, equipment replacement decisions, long-term cost reductions, leasing or buying a property, anything that's going to affect the company for multiple years in the future involving the purchase of long-term assets would be considered a capital budgeting decision. Capital budgeting decisions fall in two broad categories, screening decisions and preference decisions. Screening means does a proposal meet some set of standards set by the company? Preference is selecting among different competing courses of actions. So screening basically means is this investment opportunity worthwhile according to the minimum set forth by the company? Yes or no. Preference would be, do I choose alternative A or alternative B? Which one is better for the company overall? There are various methods that we're going to learn in the chapter to deal with these types of questions. Payback method, net present value, and internal rate of return are some of the methods that we'll be discussing. We'll also discuss the simple rate of return. That one is in its own little box at the bottom because it's the only one that focuses on incremental operating income, meaning incremental the change in and operating income is revenues minus expenses the other three me methods focus on cash flows so money in versus money out as opposed to accrual accounting which is revenues recognized when earned expenses when used what are some typical cash outflows for these types of investment opportunities well, repairs and maintenance costs, if you're going to buy a piece of equipment, at some point you may have to repair it. Incremental operating costs, so does it cost an additional amount each year to operate? The initial investment, obviously, is going to cost money up front to purchase the new equipment or property. And then working capital is the amount we need to basically run the equipment or run the business. Working capital, the way I look at it is I think of a cash register. So at the beginning of the day, a company needs to put some money in the cash register to make change. So say they put in $100 at the beginning of the day. Then during the day, they sell another $300 worth of goods. At the end of the day, in the cash register, they should have the $300 worth of goods and then the working capital of 100 they put in for a total of $400. So working capital is like the walking around money to allows the business to do its job, to pay its bills, to run the business and without running out of money. Cash inflows would include the salvage value. That's the value of the equipment at the end of its life when we sell it. Any increase in revenues, that would be a cash inflow. Reduction of cost is like a cash inflow. Saving money is like making money. And then release of working capital would be, again, that cash register example where if we put in 100 at the beginning of the day as an outflow, we get it back at the end of the day when we count the register. That original money that we put in should be there. Time value of money, again, is the concept that a dollar today is worth more than a year from now. So projects that promise earlier returns are, prof are preferable over those that promise later returns. In other words, I'd rather have $100 today than $100 at the end of five years. Because if I had it today, I could invest that money and earn additional income known as interest on that investment. The capital budgeting techniques that best recognize the time value of money are those that involve discounted cash flows. That's going to involve the net present value method and the internal rate of return method that we discuss. 
To do it all, we're going to use our HP 10B, but again, the textbook runs through using time value money charts, which I'm telling you is far more difficult to do. So the first thing we're going to talk about doesn't require our HP 10B, at least not the time value money component. So it's the payback period for the investment. The payback method focuses on the amount of time it takes to get back the initial investment. The formula is relatively easy. We just take our initial investment and divide it by the annual net cash inflow. For example, if we had an investment that was $100 and we were going to get $20 back each period, then the payback period would be five years because it would, be, it would take five years to get back our initial $100 investment. So let's look at an example. Management at the Daily Grind wants to install an espresso bar. How exciting. Costs $140,000 and has a 10-year useful life and will generate annual net cash inflows of $35,000. Management requires a payback period of five years or less on all of its investments. What's the payback period for the espresso bar? So all we're going to have to do is take the initial investment of $140,000 divided by $35,000 and that will get us our payback period. So 140 divided by 35 gives me 4. And because it's less than the required 5 years, we would move forward with investigating this investment in more detail. So we could see that the payback again is 4. And based on the company's criteria, we would invest in the espresso bar. But if we're smart, we're going to actually use some of the other tools that you're going to learn in this chapter to determine if it's worthwhile to invest in in the espresso bar just because an investment has a payback period that's shorter than our company's requirement doesn't mean that it's a really great investment for the company but this is a good way to screen investments to determine if we should do any further investigation because if we don't meet this initial screening there's no point in analyzing the investment any further let's take a look at a quick check Give it a pause and try it out. And hopefully after you tried it, you found out that A is the answer. A is going to give us a payback period after two years because 60 plus 40 gives me 100. Project Y, we're not going to get our payback period until sometime after two years because 60 and 35 is only 95. So then we're going to need some of year three's cash flow to break even. How much? We need an extra 5,000 of the 25,000, which means we need another 0.2. So technically, the payback period for Project Y would be two full years and then 20% of the third year, or 2.2. Two years is shorter than 2.2 years, but the whole point of this quick check is to answer this question which project do you think is better and hopefully you get the fact that Y would actually be better even though X has a shorter payback after the company gets their money back there's no future cash flows so we just break even at least with Y we get our payback in 2.2 years and then there's still an extra 20 grand to be had on top of the initial investment so we're actually going to make a profit with project Y so the whole point of this problem is twofold. One is to show you how to calculate payback when you have uneven cash flows like we did here. You just accumulate the cash flows until you reach your initial investment. And then the other reason to do this is to show you that just because you have a shorter payback period, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a better investment opportunity. Why? Well, there's a, several shortcomings of the payback method. One is it ignores time value of money, so it treats all of those future cash flows as if they were received on day one, which isn't the case. It also ignores the cash flows after the payback period, and that's what we saw in the quick check, where we had the payback period quicker in the first opportunity, but no cash flows after that. In the second opportunity, we had cash flows after, so that's an actual better opportunity, but according to the payback, the two-year payback period was better than 2.2. Shorter payback period then does not always mean a more desirable investment. So that's why payback period is a good starting point, but it's not the best way to screen investments. 
some of the strengths, it does serve as a screening tool so we can determine really quickly if we should look further into an investment or not. It identifies investments that at least recoup their cash investments quickly and it identifies products that recoup the initial investment quickly. So it'll tell us whether we can at least get our money back, but it won't necessarily tell us which investment is better. Again, when there are uneven cash flows, you can't use the formula that we provided. You have to accumulate the cash flows. So if we have uneven cash flows like this, after year one, the accumulated cash flows is 1,000. After year two, we're still at 1,000. Then we go to 1,000 plus 2,000 or 3,000. Then 3,000 plus 1,000 is 4,000. And then 4,000 plus 500 is 4,500. So we have to accumulate our cash flows. So if the initial investment is 4,000, then when do we get our payback? Well, I'll go back a slide. If the initial investment is 4,000, the payback happens at year four. Let's get a little trickier and let's change this to be 3,500. Well, let's do our accumulations again. After year one, we're at 1,000. We're still at 1,000 after year two. After year three, we're up to three. And then in year four, we go up to four and then 4,500. Now we know that the payback for 3,500, if that's the initial investment, would fall somewhere between year three and year four, but we have to figure out how much of year four we need. Well, we need an extra $500 to get to 3,500 after year three, so we're gonna take the 500 we need divided by the year four's total cash flows of 1,000, and that'll tell us we need half of year four. So if the initial investment was 3,500, the payback period would be 3,000 after three years, and then we'd need half of year four to get the extra 500. So the overall payback period in this example would be three plus 0.5 or three and a half. That's as complicated as payback could possibly get.